Right, we are studying on Wednesday nights the Sermon on the Mount. Where is that found in the Bible? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We come to Matthew 7 tonight, Matthew chapter 7, as we continue to look at Jesus' great message to us. And he has some very important things to say to us in chapter number 7. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12 tonight. Have you ever had somebody quote verse number 1 to you? Judge not, lest you be not judged. So many people that, uh, you know, do wrong things and all say, Oh, don't judge me. You're not supposed to judge. That's what the Bible says. Don't judge. And so uh, they pull that verse there out and say that's what it means. Well, is that really what it means? We're going to study that tonight along with some other things here in this chapter. Let's read these verses, verses 1 through 12. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye you pearls before swine, lest they trample them under your feet, and turn again and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven Give good things to them that ask him. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do for you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Anybody know the title that's been tagged to verse 12? The golden rule. You ever heard of the golden rule? Well, that's the verse that is the golden rule. So those are the verses we're going to look at tonight. And let's look at this first important matter. Judge not lest that ye be not judged, Jesus said. What in the world is he talking about? Well, as we look at all this together, look, he mentions here in verse 5, he's talking to people who would be hypocrites. Thou hypocrite. What's a hypocrite? Well, somebody that acts out a part. The actual Greek word means like a play actor, somebody who is in a play and has a part. He's not really that kind of person. He's not really that way, but he's playing the part. Hypocrites play a part. It's not really what they really are, what they should be doing, but they play a part. So when he's talking about judge not lest you be not judged, he's addressing people who would be hypocrites. People, as he says here, that wind up looking at a little mote in their brother's eye. Now, that little word there means a splinter, real thin piece maybe of wood or something. A uh, little, little small speck that's going to be in somebody's eye. He says, a person that looks at that little mote in somebody's eye and wants to pull that out, better first check and see what's in his eye you might have a whole big beam in your eye. And of course, who's he hitting a lot in all the teachings he gives here in these chapters? The Pharisees and the scribes, religious leaders who thought they knew it all, but had all kinds of problems in their own lives, particularly the problem of pride, the big beam of pride, that nobody could tell them anything they knew at all. That was their biggest problem. And so Jesus said, you better get that beam out of your eye if you're going to try to get little splinters out of other people's eyes. He's not saying here that you shouldn't do any judgment. If that's true, we have problems right in this sermon. 
because go to verse number 20. In verse, well, begin in verse 15. We'll be studying this next. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Look what he says. Ye shall know them by their fruits. How are you going to know a false prophet unless you judge their fruits? You got to do some judging there to know if a person is a false prophet, right? Look at verse 20. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So you got to look at somebody and say, oh, this person doesn't add up to what they say they are. Therefore, I need to stay away from them. They're a false teacher. You have to do some judging. And of course, definitely in other scriptures, it teaches that we have to do some judging at times. Look, if you will, at 1 Corinthians 2 and verse number 15. And this is quite an interesting verse, actually, when you see what it says. 1 Corinthians 2, 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth, all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Wow, spiritual people have got to use some discernment and judge all kinds of things that come into their life and people that come to them. They've got to make some judgment calls in all things. Over in the book of 1 John, chapter number 4, 1 John chapter number 4, notice if you will there what's said in verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out to the world. Try the spirits. You're going to have to judge the spirits of men to see if they're really true or false. So definitely some judging has to be done. In fact, the whole church is supposed to do some judging at times. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Remember here, there was a man that was guilty of fornication, a real bad form of fornication Paul mentions here where he was having relations with his father's wife. A real sad situation there. May not have been his actual mother, but still definitely wrong to, to read about that. And here it mentions to this church in verse number five, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. How can you do that unless you judge that particular person? And look at what he actually said in verse 3. Paul says, For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present. So he had to do a judgment on this man. This man was guilty of sin. He saw it, had to pronounce judgment upon him because of that. You come further down here, and the church is going to have to do some judgment. Verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners, with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. Now see, the church has to make judgment on people. There's people guilty of these sins, then these people should not be a part of your fellowship of your church. They should be excommunicated as you read on down through there. I'm not going to take time for all of it, but do look at verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? The church has got to exercise some judgment. So when you go back to Jesus' statement in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1, it's not that you can't judge anybody. The bottom line is you need to take care of judging yourself First, make sure things are right in your life before you go and try to help somebody else. You may have a bigger problem than they do. And you go with a bigger problem trying to help somebody with a little problem, you're being a hypocrite. You need to take care of the problems in your life. Galatians 6.1 might help you also with this particular situation of what Jesus is trying to teach to us here. In Galatians 6, chapter, chapter 6, and verse number 1, notice what it says here. <clears throat> I get there finally. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, here's a judgment, has to be made. A man overtaken in a fault. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. The spirit you go to try to help somebody with a problem or deal with them with a problem is that, hey, 
I could be in their shoes. Don't be high and mighty. Now, that was the problem with these Pharisees. Oh, they looked down the people. They're so much above them, so they could judge anybody any way at all. But nobody better judge them, because they're the big, high, prideful leaders. See, that was the problem Jesus is trying to hit here. And it has very much uh, information for us before we go and deal with somebody about their problems. Be sure our problems are handled before the Lord. Remember verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Be sure that when you go and deal with somebody, you're not guilty of the same thing inside. <laughs> you know, it's easy to go condemn somebody else, but then perhaps you're doing the same thing on the side. Some people are hypocrites that way. So this is what Jesus is trying to say. Now, a little more difficult verse is verse number six. What does he mean here? Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under your feet and turn again and rend you. What in the world is Jesus meaning tacking that onto the end of this section about judging? Well, give not that which is holy unto dogs. Well, he'd be talking about the truths of God. Dogs at this day and time were the Gentile people. Jews referred to them as dogs. Swine to them are unclean animals. You could not eat swine. That was against the Jewish way of eating. You don't do that. So both of these were unclean animals, you might say. He's saying, don't take the precious things of God and give them to these people who are just going to trample them underfoot. Example, if you go and try to witness to an atheist, and that atheist is ground his atheism, and we should try to witness to him, but all he does is argue and put you down and slam the Lord and and blaspheme his name, what good is it? You just have to give up and let him go. Don't cast holy things before him. You know, sometimes a person thinks, maybe I can convince this guy. <laughs> you can't convince anybody of anything. It's the Holy Spirit that's got to convince him. So the best thing to do is give the gospel to these people that want to argue, that want to absolutely not listen to what you say and try to give you a hard time about what you believe. Just give them the gospel so that the Holy Spirit can work on their heart. Otherwise, it's not worthwhile to try and do that effort. Now, Jesus is not saying don't give the gospel to people, but he's talking about these obstinate people, people that just won't listen. And the more you talk to them, the more problems you have with them. They just trample things under their feet they're not worth that particular effort. Remember when Jesus sent out the 70? He said, when you go to a city that will not receive you, what are you supposed to do? Shake the dust off your feet and leave. In other words, if they aren't going to hear you and they're just going to trample underfoot the truth of God's word, let them be. You know, you just can't get through to them. Jesus himself could not have converts in Nazareth. The people there were prejudiced against him. And he said, a prophet has no honor in his own country. And so Jesus couldn't get through, so he had to give up in Nazareth. Go other places. That's the way it had to be. And so that's what Jesus is trying to say here. When you are involved in judging someone and you know somebody is one of these false prophets and they're absolutely going to tear down the Lord Jesus Christ and not listen to you and say mean and hateful things, you're better off not to cast holy things to them. Give them the gospel only and leave them alone. If they won't listen, it's on them. It's going to be on them. So that's the idea of what he's giving in verse number 6. Then he talks about prayer for a little bit here. We're familiar with these verses of Scripture in verse 7 and 8. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Isn't it amazing that the word ask 
A-S-K. Each one of these words here you're to do uses a letter. A, ask, uh, S, seek, K, knock. So ask is ask, seek, knock. Interesting how it is here. Jesus said, everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now what's he trying to teach us about prayer there? All right, asking. You ask for something. Initially, the first thing you do from the Lord is ask, right? But if you don't at first get an answer, what do you need to do? Seek his face more. Seeking has the idea of, boy, there's something I got to find. And I'm going to work and work and work till I find it. That's seeking. In Luke 15, there was a woman who lost a precious coin in her house. Remember, the Bible says there she swept her house and sought and sought and sought till she found it. And so that's what the idea is of seeking. God wants to see sincerity on us. He wants to see we really want something. And so there's some seeking involved. Then the knocking has the idea, do you quit praying? When you knock, you expect what? The door to be opened. So you keep on knocking Till the answer comes. Now, God doesn't always answer the way we think that he will. He doesn't always give us everything we want. Sometimes he says, wait a while. Sometimes he says, no, that's not good for you. And you find that out as you pray over things for a while. The Lord just does not want you to have an answer that way. But you keep on knocking till the door opens and you have the answer to that particular prayer. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Now that's often interpreted as pray, being in an attitude of prayer all the time and we should be in an attitude of prayer all the time but the real idea of that is don't stop praying for something till you get the answer. Pray without ceasing. Keep on till the answer comes. And Jesus is teaching that here. And God wants to bless us. He gives example of earthly fathers and their children. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread will give him a stone? What good father would do something like that? Dad, I'm hungry. Can I have a piece of bread? And bread's just a, one of the staple things in the world at that time. Everybody ate bread every day. That's just one thing you do, eat bread. So, you know, it's a staple thing. The son asked for his daily bread. Jesus said to pray for your daily bread, didn't he? So the son's asking for daily bread. And so is the father going to say, no, you get a stone. He's not going to do that. A good father's going to give him a piece of bread to satisfy his hunger. Second thing that they ate much of in that day and times, fish. Verse 10, if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Can you imagine a father doing that? Father, could I have a piece of fish? No, eat the snake. <laughs> a father's not going to do that. In other words, what is being said here is basically absurd. It's not at all what's going to happen. A dad who's the right kind of dad is going to give his child some food, bread and fish, staple things in that day and time. He's going to give that to them to feed them when they're hungry. So, he uses that illustration to then give the illustration about God the Father. If ye then, being evil, then what does he mean by that? Well, compared to God, who's holy, <laughs> we're evil. I mean, there's no comparison between God and his holiness and people because we have a big problem with sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But anyway, that's what he's meaning. If we, being sinful creatures, know how to give good gifts unto our children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Now look at the comparison here. Here's a father. Son asks for bread, gives him bread. So son asks for fish, he gives him a fish. He provides the needs of his son and he's a sinful man. He's not, not at all anything like God Almighty. 
So you've got a holy God up here, a God who absolutely created everything, has in his power to do anything. Don't you think he's going to take care of his children? Absolutely. You ask and ask him for things, the Lord is going to give you good things to them that ask him. So often our problem comes in, and we're actually studying this in my Sunday school class this Sunday, James chapter 4. It mentions here one, th one way we ask that we just don't get an answer from the Lord. In James 4, look at what it says in verse number 3. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. I had a lady one time call me up, said, Pastor Gritton, I'm praying I can win the big lottery. When I win the big lottery, I am giving the church 10% of it. Boy, isn't that being so generous. She's thinking of that 90% she's going to use on herself and what she can do. I don't know what the lottery was back in that day and time, you know but that was her particular thinking. Now, what do you think that lady's really thinking about? God, I need this money. Lord, I'm gonna use all this money for you. No, she's asking a miss because she wants to consume all that money on her lust. She wants it for herself to just enjoy living the way she wants to live. For, not forgetting God told her. Giving him a little piece of it anyway. Um, that's an example of asking amiss. Or, you know, if we know something definitely in Scripture that is not right, we can't expect God to change his mind and answer that particular prayer. Maybe we say, Lord, I had, I had some people do this. Lord, I like this girl over here, but she's not a Christian. Now save her so I can marry her. Yeah. Now, again, is that the reason for somebody to get saved so that they can marry you? Do you think that's a little selfish? Are you really interested in their salvation or interested in them getting married? Hmm? You can easily see what that is. Somebody told me that one time. I said, well, I'll tell you what. You ought to pray for their salvation whether they ever get interested in you or not. The main thing is they get saved, and I'd start there and not be worrying about whether you're going to be able to date them or whatever. You pray for their salvation. That's the most important thing. So people, you know, ask the Lord things, but ask in the wrong way. Ask amiss. And all oh, the problems and difficulties that can come if God would happen to answer the prayer the way that we're asking it, you know. So we could have a big problem. But God knows what we need before we ask him, doesn't he? But he has ordained prayer as the way to get things. And in this lesson tonight, he's trying to show us exactly how we are to pray. Asking, seeking, knocking to a heavenly father who loves us and is going to do what's best for us all of the time. Well, we come to that wonderful verse, verse number 12, that we call the golden rule. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Hmm, there's an interesting verse. How do you want people to treat you? Kindness, forgiving, loving, helping. Well, if you want them to do all those things to you, you do them to them first. Whatsoever you want people to do to you, you do it to them first of all. And then they just might turn around and do it back to you. But we're always looking, you know, I've always said this, really in the world there are two kinds of people, takers and givers. 
good evaluation to see what we do with all of our things and how we live to see where we're at. Are we givers, as you look at the big picture, or are we takers in our time, in our money, in our ways of being around people and family and friends? Just how would they consider us, givers or takers? And of course, that's what it's talking about here. If you would have people to give to you and bless you, you need to give and bless them. Sometimes people say, well, I can't ever seem to have anybody to befriend me. What's the answer to that? Be a giver and go out and find a friend. You befriend people first. Sometimes people sit and wait for people to come to them. Same way when it comes to winning people to Jesus Christ. We can't sit in the church and expect people to come to us. We've got to be givers. We've got to go out and give the gospel. Give the invitations. That's what Jesus says to do. What's the first two letters of gospel? G-O, which means go. <laughs> We've got to be givers to give out that gospel if we're going to reach anybody with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So here we need to understand, and by the way, notice, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you. There's no limitations or exceptions. You need to consider everything in your relationship with others and the way you'd have them to treat you is the way you ought to treat them. Well, that person offended me. I'm not going to go to them. I'm not going to talk to them. I want nothing to do with them because they offended me. They are the offense. I did nothing wrong. Well, now, what would be the right thing to do if the ball was turned around and you were the offender? It's what this verse is saying. You would want them to come to you and get things right. So you, if you want them to be that way towards you, if it was the other way around, you need to go and try to get things solved with them. Boy, a lot of problems would happen, would, would be solved in this world today if people really did follow the golden rule. But easier said than done. <laughs> easier said than done, isn't it? Now, can you think of any illustrations yourself about exercising the golden rule? None. You've never exercised the golden rule. <laughs> well, you know, just thinking about the matter of parents and children. You know, parents are supposed to take care of their children as they're in their home and growing up, right? They should take care of their children. Children should honor their parents, obey their parents, so on. But basically, you raise them, giving them food, clothing, and shelter, and, and uh, directing them in life. And, I mean, you're just very involved in their lives. Well, as you get older and they move out of the house and get their own home, what should be the natural thing that they would do back to you because you were so giving when they were growing up to care for mom and dad and want to help you any way they possibly can. What a blessing when you see children like that. Parents were so giving to them when they were growing up, so they just naturally want to give back to their parents and do things for them and, and be so kind and helpful. That's great to have that like that right in our homes. There's an example. You practice the golden rule, can come back to you later on in life. It is. <laughs> it certainly is. Any other examples? Jim?
Well, you had to take the initiative in that, you know, and see what was best to do. And, and because of that, then things worked out. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Old so sores left open, you know, are going to fester and fester and get worse and worse. So it's best to treat them and, and get over that. Absolutely. All right, well, some good teaching by Jesus tonight, and I uh, hope we'll take it to heart this evening. Actually finishing three minutes before eight, can you imagine? I never let you out early, do I? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus' teaching to us tonight here in this passage in Matthew 7. Lord, when it comes to judging, certainly we need to take care of things in our own life first of all. There is a need to have to judge others from time to time. We have to know who's false teachers and who's true. We need to see the fruits that people have to know whether or not they're doing what they should or shouldn't do for different positions they might want. We, we just have to exercise judgment along the way when it comes to people. But Lord, we should do it in meekness. We should certainly evaluate ourselves first and be sure our hearts are right with you before we try to help somebody else get right with you. So an important lesson that Jesus is trying to give us here in Matthew chapter number 7. Then we see the importance of prayer, Lord. Certainly help us to keep asking, seeking, and knocking until you open and, and answer our prayers and Give us what's best for us, Lord. You're always going to give us good things, the best things for us, though we may not see it at the time, but you certainly will answer that way. Then, Lord, help us to practice the golden rule. That certainly will be a blessing to us in the long run, if we will, and do what Jesus said here. So be with us as we go to our homes tonight now. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night. God bless you.